Thank you. So my name is Ian Harvey. Um, I've been on the U.S. ski team back in the back in the day for quite a few years. I then switched to biathlon. Was on the Olympic team. Later, World Masters champion. So I, I've been around for a long time in uh, skiing marathons as well as skiing for the U.S. ski team internationally. I've been the head of the Toco brand in the United States since the year 2000. Toco is a Swiss brand that has been that is based in Altstadt in Switzerland in the northeast part since 1916. Toco is part of Brav, which is a sports group that a conglomerate that includes a bunch of different brands. Some of those brands are Swix, Lundhogs, Hellsport, Ulvang, and Skisporta. Brav's located in Norway. I work directly for Brav Switzerland, located in Altstadt in Switzerland. Um, there are many brands located in the Midwest and otherwise that don't give back to the community. That's something I'm very proud of, that Toco does this more than probably any brand out there. So we've we've sponsored CXC or been associated or supported CXC since its inception many years ago. We've supported Team Berkey and the CXC Elite team ever since they were created. Um, the current top three men, top 13 men on the USSA points list are either currently supported by Toco or have been supported by Toco at some point in their career. 11 of the top 13 women on the USSA points list are currently supported by Toco or have been supported by Toco at some point in their career, and that includes the top three. We are a US ski team supplier. There are only two wax brands that are US ski team suppliers. That's Toco and Swix. So if you support the Toco brand, you support US skiing, and that's the, the point I want to make. We, we, we give back and we're proud to take advantage of the opportunity that we have to support the skiing community in the United States. Toco has a two brand strategy that is Brav with Swix and Toco. We do, we are owned by the same company. We're part of the same sports group, both Toco and Swix. Um, we have very different philosophies. I don't think you can find two brands, two established ski brands in the ski industry that have more different philosophies than Toco and Swix. The differences are reflected in the product and how the product is organized. We have a different research and development. We have a lab in Altstadt in Switzerland with a, two scientists, and they're working against everyone else in the industry, including Swix. Um, Toco and Swix are each other's biggest competitors. Toco has about an 85% market share in most of the Alps, which is significant because we're talking about Switzerland, Austria, ski country. Um, I want to say many questions that were submitted, I'm going to answer or address in this introduction of TOCO starting shortly. So please pay attention now because uh, I've left a lot of the questions out because I'm addressing them now. So some key points of TOCO waxes and tools. First one is innovation. TOCO was the first company to come out with a dedicated waxing iron, the first company to use a fluorinated, to develop a fluorinated hydrocarbon wax, HF type. The first brand to use molybdenum, which everyone else used for years and years, and we continue to use in some of our products. The first perfluorocarbon in block form. Uh, the first, we have twist up grip wax containers, which are quite innovative. Helix was a very innovative product. Copper brush is unique and innovative, et cetera. A key point is Toco as a brand is innovation driven and not marketing driven. We don't introduce products because of marketing reasons and sales reasons, we introduce them because of the innovation and the advantages that we have that it gives the ski waxer. So that's the first point, there are only four. The second point is simplicity. We have fewer colors and skews, and that makes the line easier to understand, less money to buy into, and easy to use to learn the nuances of, of the line. There are a lot of nuances and more user-friendly. You can mix products rather than have a whole bunch. So for example, in the World Cup for many years, you know, normally we have yellow, red, and blue. There's an orange and a white in the World Cup. The orange is a one-to-one, -one, a premix of the red and yellow, and the white is a one-to-one -one premix of the blue and the red. We don't want that in our retail line. We don't want that in the United States. We prefer to have fewer SKUs to make it less money to buy into. You can mix them. We do that all the time, and we recommend that. So that's part of our Toka philosophy. Um, fewer products, but a lot of nuances that you'll see, you'll hear about shortly. Another thing is the third point would be performance. Olympics, World Cups, national championships are won all the time 
not only cross country skiing, but in alpine skiing and other disciplines all the time on Toko products. That's something that, that um, one of the US ski, ski team coaches told me the other day that there are three products that he named the, that he uses those three products more than any other product in any other brand. So we're represented very much in the high end racing. Last, the fourth item is service. I take pride in having the best service in the industry, both for retail shops and also for anybody who skis. Um, I want to mention one example of this because uh, it is an issue. Our drink belts are very popular. We have tons of drink belts. We have had a history of having the plastic be a little brittle. All you have to do is send me an email and I'll send you a replacement cap, assuming it's a Toco drink belt, at no charge. That's an example of the service that we try to provide that I am proud of and it's kind of personal to me. A couple fun facts about Toco. First off, um, Tobler Company was the original Toco company. It's called Tobler, Tobler Company. Toblerone chocolate bars, those pyramid-shaped chocolate bars with the Matterhorn on them, those came from that Tobler Company, the same company that Toco came from. That's pretty cool. And the second thing some people might be curious about where the name Toco came from, it came from Tobler Company, Toco. That's where Toco comes from. Okay, I want to mention uh, Toco gloves briefly, and then I'm going to get into the wax. So Toco Gloves is something that I, I take a lot of pride in and I'm excited about. Um, we use European sizing, so number number sizing from 5 to 12 with Toco Gloves. Why do we do that instead of small, medium, large, extra large? The reality is a women's large is basically the same size and same glove as a men's medium. So if you walk in a retail store and they've got women's small, medium, large, and extra large, and men's small, medium, large, and extra large, they probably really only have five sizes represented. Whereas with the European sizes, we have um, seven sizes, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. Eight sizes represented, eight separate sizes. And those sizes mean smaller increments. Like for example, a nine, I call a medium large. An eight would be a unisex medium and a 10 would be a unisex large. The most common size for women is a seven. Six would be a women's small and uh, eight would be a women's large. So um, I'm, the European sizing isn't just European, but it brings more value in smaller size increments to you. We use synthetic leather on all of our palms. Some of the other brands out there that are quite popular use natural leather. Synthetic leather, I think, is fantastic. You can wash and machine dry, machine wash and dry gloves with synthetic leather. You can't do that with natural. Um, when they get wet, they dry soft. They're super durable. So those are some selling points on having synthetic leather palms. Traditionally, the U.S. ski team uses more, more athletes on the, on the U.S. ski team use Toco gloves than all of the brands combined, traditionally, historically. This year, it's about even with one other brand. Um, but I'm, I'm proud of that, and it shows a lot about the value of Toco gloves. On all of our hang tags, we have blue, red, yellow, or as temperature designations, kind of like our waxes, make it a little easy for you. We also have on most of our gloves, external seams. The external seams, you have a seam. If the seam is internal, then the seam is between your finger and the pole and you get blisters and you can feel that seam. But if you have external seam, it's on the outside and it's not rubbing against the skin inside. So the outside of the glove looks kind of Nordic. You know, these external seams have been around for a while. But it makes sense because you don't have the seam against your finger inside the glove. And of course, should you want to have a pair of gloves for like 20 years, you can repair them real easy with external seams. One last thing about Toco gloves is we have an unconditional one-year warranty on all Toco gloves. The only caveat is if you lose them, then you're on your own. But that's significant. I don't know of any other companies that have that. Okay, so let's get into uh, um, Toco waxes and tools. So I want to talk about just some special items that I think are exceptional. And then we'll um, talk about some waxing principles and tools with principles, and then we'll get into the questions. And what I'm talking about now addresses a lot of the questions that you all answered, uh, asked. The first wax I want to highlight is called Base Performance Blue Hot Wax. This is a great training wax for the Midwest and for everywhere. One thing is different about this wax is it's softer, a little softer than the performance blue and the high performance blue. The, the levels go base performance, performance, high performance in terms of 
price and performance. Um, but this base performance blue is, it's like a blue red mix in its hardness. And I use it a ton and most teams use it a ton. Some of them use red depending on where they are geographically located. But this is my favorite wax for just waxing and skiing and waxing and skiing and getting your skis real fast. Um, and it's like I said, a little softer. It's like a blue red mix. So it's easier to work with. So that's the base performance glue, hot wax. This is our all-star as far as I'm concerned. It's not the uh, the super expensive sexy wax, uh, but it's base performance liquid paraffin blue. My opinion is this is the best wax we've ever made for its value. So this wax costs in a store $30. Um, you get about 12 pair, 12 applications with it. One key thing, and, and um, with liquid paraffins, you want to aim cold. So for most parts of the country, I just say, if it's before February and it's not raining or something, just use the blue and you'll be really happy with it. One key thing about this blue is just put it on the day before. Or what I do is I come back from a ski, wipe my skis, brush them, wipe them, and then spray this on and put them up. And then when I go out skiing, take them off, brush them real quick and go. It, it is incredible in its performance. It's the best wax we've ever made in terms of dollars per to performance base performance liquid paraffin blue. We had a number of teams the last four years contact us and say they tested it against everybody else's liquid paraffin, including the $100 plus liquid paraffins. And it was second best only to some really, really expensive ones in the red condition. In the blue condition, I don't think anything comes close. So that's the base performance liquid paraffin blue. Recommended iron temperatures. This is one of the questions that was asked. If you look at any Toco hot wax um, packaging, there's a little teeny picture of an iron and then a Fahrenheit and a Celsius temperature li listed there. That's the recommended iron temperature for that specific wax. So that's how you know what to put your iron on. Generally speaking, for blue, it's 150 Celsius. For red, 140 Celsius. For yellow, 130 Celsius. So another wax that is important to know about, this is early in the season. Um, a lot of people are getting new skis or they're getting their skis stone ground. This wax is fantastic for working on new skis or freshly stone ground skis. What makes it different? It's called base performance cleaning wax. It used to be called base performance cleaning and hot box wax. The thing about this wax is it's got an extremely low melting temperature and it's extremely soft, softer than yellow, substantially. So what this means is this will go into the base at a higher percentage and deeper. So the penetration will be both deeper and at a higher percentage than any one of our other waxes because it's so much softer. Do a few applications of this for new skis or press the stone ground skis, scraping and brushing between applications, and then harden it up with the blue. So you need to penetrate. This is one of the questions. You need to penetrate with a few layers. When I say scraping and brushing between layers, it depends somewhat on the condition of the ski. If the skis are in very good condition, the stone grind was done very well, and there's no hair or residue in the skis whatsoever, you can just keep melting it on and reheating it and reheating it. Um, but it does generally help the base of the ski to improve the, the, the uh, condition of the base of the ski to scrape and brush with a copper brush between each application. For sure, when you're hardening it with the blue, you want to scrape and brush between each application because you're reconditioning and improving the condition of the base. And you're also displacing that very soft wax and replacing with this. If you were to leave out this wax and just go with this, it wouldn't go in nearly as deep into the base or at as higher percentage. So you need to put that in first, soften the base, penetrate the base rather, and then replace it with this. Once that's done, then you're good to go. Okay, so this is a very important thing to address. I hope everyone's interested in this. It is the TOCO cold waxing system. I got a number of questions about this. There is no company, there's no brand that has cold glide waxes that come close to what I'm about to tell you. That's a fact. So listen, please. We have a product called X Cold Powder. There are three different conditions I'm gonna talk about. This is the first. X Cold Powder is a very important product. It's one of our most outstanding products, but it's also misunderstood. 
this is not a, a comparable cold weather additive that other brands have. Just based on my experience and also feedback from a lot of people, but I've got a lot of experience with this product, hasn't changed significantly in 20 years. What this product does really is it drastically improves the acceleration in cold, slow snow. So if I like to look at cold snow waxing by the speed of the skis in that snow, I don't pay so much attention to crystal shape and size. I did that for years. I don't pay so much attention to the temperature. If it's cold, let's say under 10 or 15 degrees, it's cold. There's not much free moisture in the snow. But there are many different types of snow that affect the gliding speed. And what I've learned over many years of doing this is the most important thing is if it's cold and slow, that's one type of snow and you need to address that specifically. Then you have cold and medium speed kind of average and then cold and fast. And they're dramatically different conditions, although the humidity and the temperature might be identical. So it's not just about the temperature and the humidity, et cetera. It's about how fast the skis are or the snow is, that cold snow is. So again, if it is cold and slow, I mean like squeaky slow, you want to do a glide out and it's creak, 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 creak. It's super slow climbing. The skis accelerate very slowly. What, what you need to do is improve what's called your breakaway speed. That speed is the speed at which your skis start to break free and accelerate. That's super important in cold, slow snow. This is what X-Cold Powder does. When it's cold, slow snow, put X-Cold Powder on. You can either put it on straight, which when it's really slow, that's exactly what I do. Um, it's fantastic, unbelievable. The, end, the high end speed might be similar to some other people, but the climbing speed is substantially better. So with this or without this is a huge difference, like a minute and a 10K, easy. So just, just shake this on. It's not a it's not a perfluorocarbon. It's not comparable to one of these old powders. You have to put significantly a uh, different amount on. And then you run the iron over it with a hot iron, like 150, 160 degrees Celsius, and uh, scrape it and brush it, just like a hot wax. It's incredible stuff for the cold, slow snow. I know it says X-Cold Powder. People say, oh, if it's cold, use that. It's not the way to go. Cold, slow snow. If it's cold, regular speed snow, that's more or less a sweet spot for our high performance blue or our blue waxes. Just use the blue wax and it'll be good. But no one wax has a sweet spot that's good in all three of these types of snow. That's the point. That's why I'm explaining this Toco cold waxing system to you. If it is cold, and fast, you don't care about breakaway speed. The skis are moving. What you care about, what you can't affect is the high end speed. Like if you're going in a long downhill run out, there's significant differences in speed. You can do something to improve that. What you do is you use three to four parts blue to one part yellow. You mix yellow into the blue. I don't care if it's zero degrees Fahrenheit. If it's refrozen snow, so it's super fast. If you mix some yellow in, it'll make it much faster on the high end speed. So the three types of snow, cold, slow snow, go with X-Cold powder. As it starts to speed up, you can mix the X-Cold with the blue. And then as it gets into medium, you use straight blue. And then as it goes from medium to super fast, you mix some yellow into the blue. You don't worry about the breakaway speed. It gives you tremendous high-end speed. That is the cold weather waxing system that we have from Toco. It, it beats anything out there. If you know how to, if you just listen to what I just said and do it, and you have good uh, skis and decent structure, you'll be, you'll have fantastic skis in all those conditions. One key point about the X-Cold, if you are gonna mix it, like I said, use it straight in extremely cold, slow snow, and then you're using straight blue in cold, medium, fast snow. And while it goes from, where it goes from very slow to medium, you can mix them. It's important to know how to mix them. You wanna drip the blue on, and then shake the X-Cold on and heat them in together. What the mistake a lot of people make is they drip the blue on and then take the iron and smooth it out, heating it into the base somewhat, and then drip the X-Cold on top, and then they heat it in together. And what oftentimes happens is the X-Cold stays on the surface and you're pretty much just applying blue and the X-Cold will stay on the surface. And when you scrape it and brush it, the X-Cold comes out. So make sure you drip that on, shake that on and heat them in together so it mixes completely. Okay, um, our high performance hot waxes are fantastic. 
at uh, Super Tours and U.S. Nationals the last two years. The, we tested them, but I got one great thing is getting feedback from teams. And I can tell you in the Midwest, for example, NMU, MTU, and Team Berkey used the high-performance blue and especially the red as their default wax in almost every race last year. All of the U.S. Nationals races, Super Tour races early season, and they gave me that feedback regularly. Um, and they were testing a whole lot of products. So um, that says a lot about the performance of the high-performance hot waxes. I think you can trust them. You know anyone from MTU or uh, NMU or Team Berkey? You can ask them about it. We are going to come out later this year in January sometime with high-performance powders. When they hit the market, they will be our fastest waxes. Um, it looks like we're going to have an extremely unfortunate and late delivery this year on those, but they, they are going to be our best waxes when they hit our market. High-performance liquid paraffin. Those are quite successful products for us. Um, you have to know how to apply them and when to apply them. So high-performance liquid paraffin is applied differently according to the conditions. With blue, I pretty much always exclusively apply blue the night before or the day before. So I mentioned before with the base performance of compare from blue, I would uh, come back from a ski, wipe my skis down, brush them out, wipe everything off, and then spray it on. I would do the same thing before race if I knew that it was going to be cold snow that was going to be skied in and somewhat fast. You you throw that high performance liquid paraffin blue on the day before. It it's a tremendous difference in the performance as compared to doing it race morning. It's both much faster and more durable. Uh, I know that's not convenient for some people because they want to do it race morning and test a bunch, but if you put it on the day before, it'll be way faster. So my recommendation is to put it on the day before if you know it's going to be cold and um, fairly skied in or fast snow. Like for classic races, you get that glaze. Liquid paraffins are better in glazy snow. So in classic races, you can be pretty sure it's going to be very good. Or for skate races, if the snow is a little old, you can be sure it's going to get, get that moisture film that it likes. But if it's brand new snow that's cold, you probably want to leave it alone and go with the cold waxing system I told you about. Um, on the red, generally with the red, you put it on two to four hours before, let it sit, and then brush it out and ski on it. You brush it out with the any one of those waxes with the yellow liquid paraffin polishing brush. And then the yellow is exceptional in really wet snow. So you can use it in wet snow and let it sit for like a half an hour. But we've had tremendous success for sprint races as well as for uh, 10Ks, putting it on at the start, if it's super wet, like if it's raining or if it just snowed and the sun comes out and bakes it so it's super sucky, or if it's just hot spring skiing type snow that you, know, you might've found at JN's last time it was in Cable, for example, you put the high performance liquid paraffin yellow on at the start and you ski on it wet and it's wicked fast. In fact, um, the last two years, that product has been three years, the product but has been uh, fluorine free. And I know of four World Cup podiums that happened with high performance liquid paraffin yellow, fluorine free. Of course, they were using fluorinated products in the World Cup, four podiums that happened in the World Cup biathlon races on that product. Um, they weren't Americans, obviously. So um, that, that can be very, very fast if you put it on wet. Okay. So I want to talk about um, some important principles now. One is why hot wax? Why continue to hot wax if liquid paraffins are so good? Um, there are some conditions where hot wax is faster than liquid paraffin, but oftentimes liquid paraffin is quite good. Why? There are two considerations, two answers to this. One is the speed of the ski on race day. And the other one is the long-term speed of your skis. How do you want them to be fast in six months or in two months? Hot skis, ski bases have sintered bases. They're porous. They're like skin um, in that they're porous and they need to be maintained. If you have a sintered base ski and they never get hot wax, they're going to get slow. On race day, without having any hot wax, they can be very, very fast. But in terms of the general condition of the ski, they're going to get drier and drier and hairier and uh, and worse condition and simply get slower and slower over time. But on a race day, you might have superb skis just putting on liquid paraffin and going to ski on. 
But in terms of the long-term health of your ski bases, you need to hot wax because they're sintered bases. Um, the cheap skis are made with extruded bases. They don't accept wax at all, and they don't need to accept wax at all. They're more or less sealed. It's like plastic, and and uh, there's no point in hot waxing those skis. But anything that's like a medium range ski and up, they're all sintered bases. The reason we have sintered bases is so that when the wax goes into the base, you can change the property of the base, which is a good thing. So in cold, dry snow, you can make the base super hard. Or in wet snow, you can make the base soft and hydrophobic. That's how we hot wax, to change the property of the base. And then you might want to put something on top of the base, like a liquid paraffin, or a few years ago, a top coat, um, to, to manipulate the moisture management of the, of the surface of the ski. But we hot wax to maintain our skis and to change the properties of the base to match most advantageously the properties of the snow. Hot waxing, every national team out there, every elite team out there hot waxes their skis. Hot waxing technique, what I recommend doing is doing three passes of the first pass very slow, maybe 45 seconds from tip to tail, the second pass medium, and the third pass fast. If you do all three passes at the same speed, you'll probably burn your skis the third pass, or your first pass will be too slow, uh, too fast, and you won't get enough heat in the base. The reason I go slow, medium, fast is because the ski base starts out room temperature, and it takes a while to, for it to get warm and for the wax to, to get hot and for the wax to warm up and to hot waxing actually occurs when the base of the ski warms up to the point that it expands and starts to accept wax. You Even if a wax is molten, it's not gonna go into the base unless the base is warm or hot and expanded. So the first pass needs to be slow so that the ski base warms up, uh, the wax gets molten, et cetera. It takes longer to do that. But now that the ski base is already pretty warm or hot, the second pass can be medium speed. And then at this point, you're in danger of hurting your skis. That third pass needs to be faster. You can take your hand, put it in the base of the ski and feel, I find the back of my hand is more sensitive. If you can't hold it on there for a couple of seconds, you're probably overheating your base. You need to be, that's the what I use as a kind of litmus test to see how hot my bases are. And I generally do that before my third pass or after my third pass. Uh, you definitely don't want to do back and forth with the iron. It's not, I've heard people talk about ionization of the wax and aligning the wax and the, the molecules and that. It's basically, if you have a ski base and you're going like this and you go back and forth like this, the chances of you burning your base is very high compared to if you just go tip to tail constantly with a known temperature, a known slow, medium, fast pace. You, you want to heat your bases up to the point where that it's warm as you want it to be, such that it accepts more wax. If you're playing around going back and forth like this, you're playing with fire because you want, again, you want to heat your base up. The hotter the base is, the more wax it accepts. You go over that heat threshold and you burn your base. So you want to get it to where you want it. And then you get maximum wax penetration without hurting your base. If you go back and forth, you're taking risk because there are spots that are getting more heat and you, you end up risking burning your base. Okay, one other very important concept, and this um, this addresses a lot of the questions that we got, it's snow versus air temperature. Uh, this is basically, I'm gonna be talking more about more than just about snow versus air, but it's it's more or less wax, live wax selection. And this also has to do with kick wax selection. All of our waxes have recommended air and snow temperatures on them. All of them do. They don't work very well. No company's recommendations for air and snow temperatures, they're just rough guidelines. What those air and snow recommendations are more or less, we look at air temperature and snow temperature. Snow temperature is more important, but a lot of people prefer to look at air temperature because it's easier. What you're trying to ascertain is how much free moisture is in the snow. How wet is the snow? How much moisture is in the snow? If it's zero degrees Fahrenheit, there's very little moisture in the snow. If it's 40 degrees Fahrenheit, there's quite a bit of moisture in the snow. And then that also has to do with humidity and so on. But that's that's just only one factor. And that's only one thing we're trying to ascertain. But there are many other factors that need to be considered. But let's just go back to snow and air temperature. That's a very important thing to understand. 
Um, out west, we have conditions that are more extreme than you do in the Midwest. But let's just use the Berkey as an example. This is a very common thing at the Berkey. Uh, race starts at 8.10, and you have people skiing until 1 in the afternoon, let's say. Um, at 8.10 in the morning, it might be 5 degrees Fahrenheit. And the snow temperature will probably be around 5 degrees Fahrenheit. Usually, the snow temperature matches the air temperature around 7 or 8 in the morning when it's at its coolest. And then the air warms much quicker than the snow. The snow will change or warm much slower than the air. Um, and so it might be at 10 a.m. when a lot of people are skiing or even starting, the air temperature might be, let's say it was five degrees as a low overnight. And the end of February, the air temperature might be at 10 a.m., call it 20 degrees. But the snow might be eight degrees or 10 degrees. You need to wax for the snow temperature. The air temperature is only a precursor for the snow temperature, and it's misleading. Um, we have a lot of people that um, will go to a race where the start temperature at the race might be, let's say, 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And then the high, the forecasted high for that day, let's say, is 35. And they're thinking, well, heck, you know, um, I'm going to be skiing around 11. I probably ought to be waxing for something around 35 degrees. But the snow temperature might still be around 15. That's what you need to wax for. And that means there's far less moisture in the snow. So you got to pay attention to the snow temperature. You don't necessarily need to go out and measure it. Just understand it. If the snow temperatures start out at the forecasted low, which is 7 or 8 a.m. usually, the forecasted low, and then look at when your start is after the forecasted low. Like the forecast low is around 8 a.m., let's say. If your start's at 10 a.m., and then look at the forecast at high for the day and kind of draw a line between them. So if at uh, 8 a.m. the snow the air temperatures, which means snow temperature at, at, at that time, is 10 degrees Fahrenheit. And then uh, the forecast at high for 2 in the afternoon is 35 degrees Fahrenheit. So from 10 degrees Fahrenheit to 35. Two hours later at 10 a.m., I would say just looking at it and probably be a snow temperature of around 15, but the air might be 25. So that's really important to consider is being able to do that kind of extrapolation. Additionally, uh, I don't wanna make things co complicated, but I also wanna um, kind of teach principles that help you identify the proper wax. If you were looking at new snow versus old snow, generally speaking, when it's cold, when it's wet, it's different. But when it's cold, new snow demands a harder wax, requires a harder wax, both in kick and also in glide, than old snow, which you could do it, use a softer wax. It's more, the crystals are rounded, it's more skied in, it's faster, et cetera. Um, so skied in snow versus non-skied in snow. Let's say you're doing a point to point and you're gonna be up front somewhere and you're skiing. The snow's gonna be less skied in. You need to wax colder than someone who's in 200th place behind you. The snow will be more skied in. There'll be more of a moisture film. It'll be faster for them, and they can get away with a slightly softer wax. Especially, this is important when you're looking at skate as well, but especially multi loop classic races. Let's say it's a three loop classic race. Same snow temperature, same air temperature. If you're doing a three loop classic race as compared to a point-to-point a -point race, um, okay, a point-to-point -point race where you're in front, <laughs> or if maybe you're the first starter in a three loop classic race, um, if you're a later starter in a three loop classic race, you need to wax substantially warmer than you would if it was uh, a one loop classic race, for example, because you'll have less people skiing in front of you. The, the tracks get so glazy at that water or ice film so much earlier, you need to use a, a warmer wax for glide and for kick. Um, humidity, you know, glazing, not glazing, that's something you need to consider when choosing your wax. If it's um, windblown or not, if it's windblown, go colder. If it's not, then okay. So these are a lot of considerations. Basically, aim colder or, or aim warmer. That and snow temperature versus air temperature and extrapolating, that's a skill of being able to extrapolate what the snow temperature is gonna be when you're skiing. 
A lot of people, like I said, make the make the mistake of waxing too warm and just looking at the air temperature when they think they're going to be skiing and they they wax way too warm, not only for kick, but also for glide. If you wax too warm for kick, you can ice up. If you wax too warm for glide, your skis will be not only slow, but they'll accelerate and climb especially slow. So those are important considerations. The Toco grip system. Our grip waxes are different from other brands. We have a total of only five grip waxes, uh, four grip waxes in a binder, so five grip waxes and four clisters. That's not very many. Our philosophy is to cover 85 to 90% of the conditions. So on an average winter, I would guess that most of you use four or five grip waxes. That's what we're trying to capture with our line. There are some conditions where we don't have a good solution and we're okay with it because our four temperature sensitive wax, especially three of them, they're good in almost everything. And then our binder, our base green is extremely good. And there are some tricks that you can use with it. So um, that's the concept behind our grip waxes. We also have uh, two spray clusters. One's the base green and one's a red or universal. They work really well in what I call tweener conditions. So if it's between grip wax and clister, uh, grip wax might be a little slick and a clister might start to ice up. You use the spray clister and you can put it on such a thin layer that it actually works really well in these tweener conditions as long as you're using soft enough skis to get your camber down. A lot of people make the mistake of doing a light spray and putting on clister skis and it's such a thin layer they can't get the camber down. So you need to do that with softer skis like a powder ski. Another thing about that spray base green clister is it is an absolute dream wax and a thumb saver for coaches on race day when they have to do a lot of skis. The quality of that product is just as good as our tube clister. The one thing is you spray it on, take your thumb and run it through it. <clears throat> and the butane evaporates very quickly. After a couple of minutes, it's, it's, it's the exact same product as the tube clister, but it, it, it makes things it makes life real easy for you. Okay, regarding kick waxing, we have two tricks um, that I want to, I mean, obviously, I could talk about layering and all the different, but I I think um, I don't need to talk about every single thing, but there are two tricks that have to do with the toka line that work really, really well that I want to expose to you. One is called the base green kick. Sometimes there are conditions where it's, again, kind of between clister and hard wax, and the conditions are somewhat... Um, it's like semi-transformed, or you have multiple conditions on the course. So you might have a, a part of the course that exposed to sun and is a little slushy uh, or a little bit, and then parts that are bone dry in the woods. You might have transformed snow in one part that went through a melt and freeze cycle, but in the woods, you might have powder. Um, this is extremely good for semi-transformed snow and multiple different types of conditions in the snow on the course. The base green, uh, base green is actually really draggy. So it kicks on everything, but it's quite slow. So what you need to do is use it on a pair of stiff skis, clister or at least hard track skis, and then keep your pocket short. Like a clister pocket would be the longest you want to do. If it's on hard track skis, just keep it shorter than you would apply your regular grip wax. You want to do one layer, heat it in with the iron or heat gun or whatever you want to do, some heat source, heat it in and smooth it out and then reapply it a few times, corking between the application until you can barely see the green through the on the black base, then stop. Um, and at that point, it'll be able to kick like a monster and everything, it's like roller ski kick. The key thing is though, it's slow, so you have to keep it off the snow. So your skis have to be stiff enough and you have to put it on short enough so that you're not dragging real bad unless you don't care. Um, I waxed John Bauer's skis in the uh, 2002 Olympics using that. In the 50K, it started out um, non-transformed, fairly cold snow. And by the end of the race, the 50K, it was slushy and uh, had a, a massive uh, change in, in temperatures and conditions during the race. He got eighth in that race and uh, he had awesome skis. That, was, that worked real well. And um, we waxed some other skiers and that race too with the same exact combination. Base green doesn't change for over 20 years. It's super successful for us. That's that's worked well. Another trick we have is called the base green sandwich trick. 
So this is very good for also semi-transformed snow, especially when it's kind of sugary. So semi-transformed but sugary, where the snow gets broken down and it's a little loose. Start out with an application of base green, normal, normal application, thin application of base green, heat it in and smooth it out. And then go with your wax of the day. Let's say it's red, a thin layer of red throughout the entire pocket. And then another layer of green, thin layer of green on top of the red, cork it, every layer of cork in between, and then cover it again with red. And then do uh, like a half or two thirds pocket with the base green again, and then cover it with the red, corking each time. And the base green is very gummy. It's very gummy. It's got a, it's a very unique consistency, and it adds a lot of cushion to your ski base and your camber, your wax job. And that sugary snow that gets broken down, especially in marathons, um, like the Berkey and the more of Ocelopet and such, it, it, it sticks better because that cushioned pocket, and it'll give you better kick and much more durability. And as you wear through those layers, the base green gives you a really good kick. So that's, we call it the base green sandwich trick. It works really well. Hey, skins, I got a bunch of questions about skins. We want to treat skins, or the product we have for treating skins is called Eco Skin Proof. Obviously, it doesn't have, we don't make anything that has fluorine in it. Um, Eco Skin Proof, it's a biosilicone is what we, the active ingredient. Basically, everybody does this wrong. When we are treating our skins, first off, the conditions that skins need to be treated in especially are conditions where there's some moisture in the snow or you want to prevent the skin from freezing and icing up. So generally speaking, if it's five degrees Fahrenheit and you're using skins, that's probably not a, you know, you don't need to use skins in those conditions. But if you are going to, treating the skin doesn't really help because there's no moisture in the snow. Their, their skins aren't going to freeze. It doesn't really matter. But where you start to get some moisture in the snow where your skin can freeze, and ice up, that's when you need to really worry about skin. So somewhere starting around 25 degrees and all the way up into the really wet stuff. Um, it's not just um, worrying about icing, but also getting saturated is a huge issue with skins. And so when we treat the skins, what we're trying to do is waterproof, make our skins water resistant so that water cannot penetrate or does not penetrate our skins. I, uh, the, the technology used in waterproofing is the same as when you waterproof uh, jackets and pants and things like that. We have a lot of knowledge about waterproofing. That's one of the things we do. And it's the same technology as ski wax. There's something that for some reason, no one seems to know this or accept it, but um, I see this all the time. Someone shows up, they're gonna use their skins, they spray the skin in their car and they go out and start skiing. That doesn't hardly do anything, it, you, except you feel good about having used the product. But in terms of waterproofing your skin, that does basically nothing. It might be somewhat water resistant for five or 10 minutes, and that's it. You've, you've done nothing whatsoever. In order for a skin or a garment to be waterproof, you need to treat it ideally 24 hours before you expose it to water. That's the same with any product out there that has a spray. Any flooring or fluorocarbon, as well as any silicone based product, any brand, anything. You need to do it for maximum performance 24 hours before. So what I do is I'll go and treat my skins when they're dry and I don't even know what I'm gonna use them next. And if they sit for a month, fine. If they sit for a day, fine. But if they sit for five minutes, they're not waterproof at all. We have a lot of knowledge about this. It takes, there's a, a waterproofing net that forms in the skin and it takes about 24 hours for that to fully develop after a couple hours, it'll it'll be somewhat developed, a little bit. And after five minutes, it'll be kind of water resistant because of this loose moisture in the skin, but that'll be gone in no time flat. So if you want to have better performance in your skins, especially in the spring, when you're trying to prevent saturation of your skins, treat your skins at least the day before. You can store your skins treated for a month. There's no negative effect whatsoever. That's how you waterproof your skins. Cleaning skins, that was another question that was in the list. Um, we have skin cleaner. Don't spray the skin cleaner onto the ski with the skin. It'll be too much and it'll affect, it can break down the skin itself, the fibers, 
and it can also affect the glue. So what you want to do is spray it onto a cloth or a fiber lean, and then wipe that onto the skin in the direction of travel, tip to tail, and then clean your skin that way. Cleaning skins is important, but it's most important in the spring, of course, when you're skiing on dirty snow. Okay, um, I'm going to go into brushes, a brush overview. There are a lot of brushes in the market. Toco has like six. I use three main brushes that I want to show you and explain to you. And if you use this system, you'll be very happy with your results. The first one is the copper brush. This is our best selling brush and our best brush overall. The copper brush does everything a metal brush that you want a metal brush to do and not the things you don't want a metal brush to do. For example, it's really good at cleaning your skis and exposing structure, but it doesn't cause hair on your, on your base, which is a critical point. <clears throat> um, so this is your utility brush. After you've skied and before you wax, Brush your skis out with a copper brush and then wipe off all the particles, do your hot waxing, let it cool, scrape. And then no matter what color or hardness hot wax you've hot waxed with, brush it with a copper brush as your first brush. Your second brush would be depending on what you waxed with. If you waxed with X cold or blue, in other words, cold temperature wax, go with a horsehair brush. The horsehair brush is extremely fine bristles very, very fine and quite stiff and aggressive for uh, what it is. And what that means is it'll get the wax and out of the base really fast and expose a microstructure of the base very, very quickly, which is exactly what you want in blue conditions. You don't want wax on the surface of your ski base. You want your microstructure exposed. You don't want any wax on the, on the, on the surface of your ski. If you're waxing with red or yellow, use the nylon polishing brush. The nylon polishing brush has very fine bristles as well, but they're very soft. And it leaves a slight sheen on your base while at the same time exposing your structure. And that sheen is very helpful in red and yellow conditions. We have a few other brushes that I didn't mention. One is the combi brush, which for me is an economical choice, but has no um, adv advantage. It's a copper and all purpose nylon mix. I don't recommend that brush, but it's quite popular. And then we have these so-called all-purpose white nylon brushes. It's been around for decades, 50 years. Those brushes have very fat bristles. They're very different from the nylon polishing brush. They have very fat, fat bristles. They don't get into the structure. They don't clean out your structure. They don't open your structure. They're not really good for anything except for, I guess you could say, a beginner just trying to expose something. But in that case, I would use the copper brush as a one brush system. Um, I don't actually use the white nylon all-purpose brush for anything. I haven't used it for 15 years. But the nylon polishing brush is very good for finishing red and yellow waxes after you use the copper. We do also have a polishing brush. It's identical to the, to the white nylon, the polishing brush. It's identical, but it's yellow. The reason we made it yellow, even though it's identical, is it's, it's for finishing the liquid paraffin waxes. So we made it yellow so you can designate it because you don't want to have paraffin from hot waxes on it and get that on top of your liquid paraffin. So those are the brushes I recommend. It's very simple. And I generally have a training brush that would be the copper brush. That was an old racing brush that I decided I'm going to turn into a training brush and look at a new racing brush and cycle them that way. That training brush I also use for cleaning with wax remover. So uh, a clean base is far faster than a dirty base. Um, you can use liquid paraffin or wax remover, spray the liquid paraffin in the base or wax remover, and then take the copper brush and scrub and brush it out really aggressively. Then take some fiber lean uh, with a block or without, but I like using a block, and I rub it really hard so it's a good friction, and you remove any dirt that's in the base. That's the best way of doing it, using that training copper brush with uh, liquid paraffin or with a wax remover. Um, Structure tool. We have a, a vastly improved structure right Nordic race that came out last year. This is the kit version. We also have it, you can have just buy this one with the red, but this is an extremely effective tool at main, making sure you have fast skis. It has two bits. One goes here, one goes here. So, and it's a left and right 
screw. And it, it, it creates a, the fishnet, a diamond pattern. And these fishnet patterns, the left and right screws, have been the leading patterns for many, many years. Um, they're always in there and they're very effective. So the blue is a half mil, the red is a one mil, and the yellow is a one and a half mil. This is, especially with, with uh, abandoning fluorinated waxes, is probably the most important thing you can get. I highly recommend getting this kit. Um, and it's something you can use for 20 years. We haven't changed the last one for 20 years, and it'll serve you well. So that's something I should mention. Um, I had some questions about structure, and that's how you do it. Okay, um, before I get into the questions, I want to mention some important, what I would consider important things. First off, we generate TOCO Nordic race wax tips. I know a lot of companies out there do that. There is no other company out there that's got what is similar to the TOCO Tech team. I got 35 people throughout the country. They have been doing this. Generally, they've all been doing it for 15, 15 or so years. They're very experienced. They know the tendencies of each local area and each event. Um, some of the events, let's say the uh, Great Bear Chase, There's there, there are nuances about the Great Bear Chase that if you've done it a number of years after one another in a row, then you know, okay, I need to wax a certain way especially if the weather's a certain way, you know, it's going to get really warm or stay cold, or you need to be careful about classic skiing on this last hill and so on. Um, our, our tech team members have that experience in history, but there's no other team of wax techs throughout the country working for another wax company. Um, how do they generate their tips? You might notice that, that generally their tips for their regional and local races come out after our tips. Uh, enough said. We're the only team like that in the country. It's expensive and it's the most important thing we do, serving you with the best quality wax tips we can offer. If you want to sign up for those wax tips to get them per email, you go to tokous.com. In the bottom right, there's a sign-up sheet formula. Uh, we send them out every Thursday during the winter. And also on Tuesdays, the same people that sign up for those get a um, an e blast that's got how to information, product information, a lot of videos and such. Tokyo US also has an extensive library of how to and product videos. The direct URL, if you want to go to it directly, is tokovideos.com. We also have a YouTube channel. Those videos have gotten over 800,000 views. They're quite popular. They average three to five minutes and they're um, topic specific, like how to cork, how to apply grip wax, how to layer grip wax, how to use the structure, right? How to, et cetera. Um, so again, sign up at Tokyo US in the bottom right to get those e-blasts and wax tips if, you, if you're interested. Okay, so I'm now, I'm now gonna address your questions. I got about 24 of them that I see that I haven't already addressed. The first question, with new skis, what is recommended to get to the what is recommended to get them to the point of adding the first wax of the day layer? So we talked about that. Start out with base performance, cleaning wax, a couple layers, three layers, heating between each time. If the skis are in great shape, scrape and brush and reapply. If the skis are in great shape, just keep, keep heating, let it cool completely and go back and heat it and so on. And then scrape and brush really well and do two layers of blue, scraping and brushing with a copper brush really well between each application. Once you've done that, then you're ready for just skiing and waxing. So it's penetrate and then harden. Can you touch on any special considerations for no wax skis? So no wax skis obviously is different from skin skis. The main challenge that people have with no wax skis is they get them icing up when it's snowing or new snow around freezing. The reason you can, we have a product called Grip and Glide Wax. It uh, keeps the snow from sticking to the bases. It works quite well. But the reality is, if you have dirt in your fish scale, tread pattern, step pattern, et cetera, if there's dirt in there, it doesn't matter what you're going to do. You're going to, in the wrong kind of snow, you're going to get stilts. So what you need to do is clean that out. Um, if people use wax in their tread pattern and say, I'll just clean it later, that's a huge mistake because it sticks in the corners, even if they try to clean it out. Dirt sticks to that, and then it's a nightmare. So um, the way to 
rectify that problem is to use a brush and some soap and water and scrub the heck out of scrub the heck out of it clean it as well as you possibly can including in the corners and then you can use wax remover on it as well and then before you ski apply the grip and glide wax and you'll have good performance but if there's dirt in that tread pattern you are never going to have good skis you will have that stilt stilt problem in new snow around freezing or 35 degrees so that's the key structure after I've applied and scraped and brushed the glide wax of the day, should my last step before going skiing be to apply hand structure on the glide zones with a hand structure tool? How important is it to get good glide to also incorporate applying hand structure to the base of the ski? So the principle, the best time to apply hand structure is after you've used, used the iron for the last time. When you use an iron on structure, it minimizes it. Generally speaking, you don't want to do that to your structure. So let's say you're waxing with base performance blue covered with base performance red liquid paraffin. So you drip your blue on, you iron it in, let it cool, you scrape, and you brush. At that point, you're done using the iron. Apply your hand structure, and then spray on your liquid paraffin red and you're done that's how you want to do it and that way your hand structure is sharp and not minimized by using the heat and you can apply wax on top like a liquid paraffin because it goes on very very thin and you can polish brush it on top and that won't affect your structure negatively so apply your hand structure after the last time you use the iron of course after you've scraped and brushed with my skin skis before every ski, I apply a de-icer to my skins, but after the ski outing, should I apply the skin cleaner to my skins? First part of the question. Answer would be no. I, I would not do that unless you're picking up clister or if you see clister on the track or something like that. But if it's really clean snow, um, I wouldn't worry about cleaning your skins. Only if people are using clister or if you're skiing through tobacco like they do in Scandinavia, people spitting in the or you know, dog poop or a lot of pine needles or uh, dirty snow, then yes, for sure. Some man-made snow looks clean and is quite dirty, so that's another consideration. But yeah, of course your skins will pre perform better if they're clean. If you run paper towel or fiberline over your skin without even applying a skin cleaner, and you look at it and it's dirty, then you have dirty skins. And that's an easy way to ascertain if they're dirty or not. Um, continuing, should I put the skin cleaner on thin or thick? Will the skin cleaner possibly delaminate the skins? That's what I mentioned earlier. You want to put it on a cloth or a fiber lean and then, or a base text, and then go in the direction of the skin, tip to tail, and clean it that way. Otherwise, you do run the risk of breaking down your skin's fibers and delaminating. And I'll repeat, when you waterproof your skins, when you fit your skins, Put it on any, whatever product you're using, put it on the day before, and your results will be far, far better. Okay, um, I still ski the same race skis that I used in college pre-floral band. How permanent is the floral on my skis, and will they fail tests if I were to get tested before a race? Obviously a common question in this day and age. This is not a problem. <clears throat> First thing you need to do is clean your wax room very, very well. Clean your bench, clean your surface area, clean your scrapers perfectly, um, your iron, obviously. All your tools need to be cleaned very, very well. Um, you can pick up wax inadvertently. And then the next thing you need to do is throw your brushes out. That's my recommendation. And get new brushes. Um, it's really difficult to completely clean the flooring out of a brush. Same with roto brushes and roto fleece and merino wool rollers. All that stuff needs to be replaced completely. <clears throat> Outside of that, I recommend you can use a floor solvent like a race wax mover or something on your skis. But the reality is just do four, three um, hot wax with a base of non florida wax like base performance blue. Heat it in well. Let it cool. Scrape and brush really well. And you'll be removing wax that might have been flooring that's in your base. Every time you do that, 
you'll displace it. Do that with red three times and you should be totally fine. Even, even after that all. One important caveat is if you have your skis stone ground mid season, there's a good chance you'll have flooring deeper in your base that wouldn't have tested positive. But once you, if you do a, a stone grind, you actually expose that flooring that's deep in your base. So once you have a stone grind, you need to do a post stone grind treatment. Just basically well, what I would do anyway was use the cleaning wax a couple times and then the blue a couple times and that'll get rid of it anyway. But just be aware after a, a stone grind and a pair of old skis that have uh, fluorinated products in them, that can bring up exposed fluorine and you can get a positive test. So that's an important point. What would be the best way to get fluoro out of my bases? We just covered that. How do I clean brushes that may have been used on skis with floral waxes or should I get new brushes? You can vacuum them. You can soak them in wax them over and bound them on the table. You can rub them on the snow, you know, ski. And I would get new brushes. You don't want to mess around with the fluorine. They're difficult to clean. Um, that's my recommendation to simply get new brushes. Is there a speed advantage to using a liquid wax covering an iron wax in races of 42 kilometers or more, such as the Swedish Vasilope? Yes, there's, there's an advantage in a 1K race and there's an advantage in a 100K race. Um, especially in a longer race, if you have more layers of wax like that, then your wax job will last longer. So in a case of a 42K, I would do my hot wax. Generally speaking, that hot wax would be harder because the toco, at least liquid paraffins, perform better under over a harder wax. And then I would apply the liquid paraffin. One thing about liquid paraffin that's important to notice is you don't want to put it on too thick. It generally performs worse if you put it on thick. Just just, just spray a light spray on. Um, definitely not enough to make the skis drip. Definitely not enough or puddle. In any case, yes, the answer is yes to that question. I would like to know what application methods are best for the new spray on waxes. So liquid paraffins from different brands are different. The I mentioned earlier the toco application depends on the how much the if you're using blue, let it sit overnight. If you're using red, around four hours. And if you're using yellow, put it on wet. Or if it's a longer race, let it sit for half an hour. <clears throat> I think that's for finishing them. Generally speaking, I've tested all sorts of stuff. The polishing brush seems to be a very good overall way of finishing them. I should mention the toco liquid paraffins are different from a lot of the other ones in the market. We have the smallest particle size. A lot of uh, products perform better if you use, if you apply some kind of heat. So using a thermal pad, a fleece roller, a merino roller, um, even some brands have said suggest using a heat gun. Um, what they're doing is making the particle size smaller. If you look at our liquid paraffin under a microscope, you'll, you'll, they'll look like pebbles in a road. And if you look at other brands, liquid parabens in a microscope, they look like boulders in a road. That's the difference, basically. If you apply heat to those boulder in the road brands, which is all the other ones, then you can make the particles smaller. But um, those types of post application <clears throat> finishing techniques don't seem to help much with the toco products. Just apply them the way I mentioned it, and you'll have good skis. One reason why having a small particle size is very advantageous is. Um, it, it makes this, the wax more durable and faster. Um, if you don't need to heat the wax in order to make it fast, like with a small particle size, then you can put a hard wax underneath, like a blue, even if it's red conditions. And the blue will give you more durability, more dirt resistant and better acceleration. And then you put the red on top, if it's, if it's really warmer, like a red condition, over the blue, and you'll have more hydrophobic, more uh, water resistance and Gliding um, uh, characteristics, while at the same time, you're not hardening the base. So it gives you the best of both worlds. You get the durability, dirt resistance, and acceleration of a hard base, while that top coat, if you will, of the red on top, not heating it, which means not softening your base, gives you all the advantages of the red wax. If you were to use a liquid paraffin from the brand and you were to heat that wax in, let's say you've been putting a red over a, a blue base, you're basically heating that in and it's the same as having a red wax, red hot wax. It's the same with the toco. If, if you were to heat in 
that red that we're putting in over the blue, you now have red in your skis. So <clears throat> not applying heat makes a big difference and with the Toco products gives you an advantage. I would like to know, I think I just covered that, yeah. Uh, top coats and their best applications and what to apply in the grip area of zero skis, conditioning and racing for high school racers. So for me, um, top coats and their best applications and what to apply in the grip area of zero skis. For zero skis, I would use ski eco skin proof. Um, I understand zeros are made right before the race, but it's still, that's that's better than nothing by far. If you have zeros that are that are ready made, put it on earlier and they'll perform better. Otherwise, top coats are the best applications, what to apply in the grip area, conditioning and racing for high school. I would say for me, liquid paraffin for high school skiers, I would use, be using the blue about 80% of the time. Super quick and easy, less uh, intimidating for the kids, um, less barrier to entry, um, affordable, and very fast if you do it right. How do I assess conditions to apply the correct wax? This is what I talked about earlier about snow temperature versus air temperature and also all the different conditions or factors to consider. Is the snow skied in as a multi-loop race or is it a point to point? <clears throat> Earlier starter versus later starter, how skied in the snow is, wind blown versus not, old snow versus new snow, humidity, is it gonna glaze or not? Each one of those you aim either colder or warmer. Um, that's the most important part of wax selection, both for kick and for glide. You need to be able to predict the conditions when you're skiing and considering these things helped you predict the conditions for when you're actually skiing. Testing's great, but it only gets you so far because you need to know, let's say, uh, this might be a big race that you're all hyped up for and everyone's out, let's say the race starts at 9 a.m., everyone's out at 5 a.m. testing. That's great, it gives you ballpark, you know, what, what's generally working, but the reality is the conditions at 5 a.m. are nothing like that, they're gonna be at 9 a.m. when you're in the middle of the course. Um, you need to be able to predict what the conditions are like when you're on the course and then wax for them. If it's a, a four loop course and it's a classic race, testing at 5 a.m., the only person out there is not gonna tell you a dang thing. They're, it's gonna glaze up like crazy when you're out there and you need to anticipate that and wax for that, for example. I'd like to know more about techniques for very cold conditions and for putting texture on the bottom of the ski. I covered that earlier with that so-called Toko cold weather waxing, cold waxing system, um, as well as a structure tool. So in the very cold conditions, you generally don't want to add structure unless the snow is fast. If it's fast, you definitely want to add structure, go with the blue. <clears throat> what glide wax application method will result in the greatest durability during a marathon distance cross country ski race? In a in a, for durability, for a marathon distance cross country ski race, you want to start out with a very hard underlayer. That's super important. A very hard underlayer. And then on top of that, the wax of the day. But um, there are a lot of races where, especially out west in the spring, but you'll, you'll find that sometimes at the Great Bear Chase and even at the Berkey, you can start out at below zero temperatures with below zero snow temperature. By the time the race is over, the air temperature might be in, uh, depending if you're taking a little bit longer to get to the race and it's a longer race, it might be in the like 40 degrees at the end of the race in the spring. In that case, my recommendation for glide is to use a very hard underlayer and then do wax for the cold conditions at the start. If you think, okay, I'm gonna use a cold underlayer and then I'm gonna put a warmer wax on so when I hit the second half of the race, my ski is going to go. The problem is you're going to have slow skis for the first half of the race. And by the time you hit the second half of the race and that cold abrasive snow, the first half, you're not going to be wax of that soft wax left in your skis anyway, because the softer waxes aren't nearly as durable. So wax for the first half of the race for glide, and you'll still have better skis for the second half than if you waxed for the second half of the race. Hope that makes sense. Um... How is cold, ex, cold, Toco X Cold Powder Additive different than very cold base waxes like Swix Turquoise or Polar? What are the preferred use cases when both are available? So I mentioned the X Cold Powder is phenomenal when the conditions are slow and cold, slow and cold. 
In that case, use it straight or mix it with blue, depending on how slow it is. And you'll find that you'll climb faster and the skis will accelerate earlier, better breakaway speed. That's the key right there. Just a couple questions left. Physics question. Which snow sliding professionals might have inside on in very cold conditions when classic skiing and tracks, does the friction from the skier sliding in front non-trivially decrease the friction of a skier immediately behind due to the increase in snow temperature, thus taking less energy to remelt that snow a second later? Basically, hot like drafting, but for snow friction rather than air. Yes, this happens for sure, definitely. Basic waxing for high school skiers. Number one, listen to your coach. Number two, if it was up to me, I would use base performance liquid paraffin and hot wax blue for maintaining my skis and the couple toco glide waxes for grip. Simple yet effective. Skin care, uh, I mentioned that. Storage waxing. I would recommend storage waxing for the summer with red. Reason red, if we use blue, it chips off and you get air between the base and the wax. Doesn't protect the, the, the base. If you use yellow, I find it gets eaten up during the summer and fall. And there's hardly, or basically, there are a lot of places that, of the ski base after many months where there's basically no wax left on the ski. But the red is viscous enough to, to seal the oxygen out to protect the base, but it's hard enough not to get eaten up <clears throat> over the summer. So I recommend using red. <clears throat> When do you know how to rewax your skis after skiing on them a while? To me, this is a standards question. I One of the key things for having fast skis is don't let your bases dry out. That's a key thing. The US ski team, the combined team, the biathlon team, they all focus on this. You let, you let your ski bases dry out in training, not waxing them enough. Um, then you get dryness. And then when you heat, you seal your base. Um, it's bad for your base. You want to keep your bases in the best condition possible if you have a high standard or high expectation like a national team skier. So it has, this really has to do more with your standard. So uh, for me, I hot wax at least every other time I ski, at least. And some other people who are totally happy hot wax once a week, every five skis, but um, their skis aren't as good shape as my skis. And it's a standard question as far as I'm concerned. Can you do anything to your ski base to maintain absorption qualities between stone grinding? This is the same question as the last one, actually. Um, you don't want to ski a ton without waxing. I, If you want to have per, the highest absorption qualities to your base, don't create any hair in your base and then don't heat those hairs. And that hair is from getting abraded, from skiing on a dry, a bread, dry base of abrasive snow, um, so the just wax hot wax every time, and you're you will have the best condition skis, best absorbing skis, etc. Choosing a cluster, what variables should a coach look for in selection? How transformed the snow is? How much moisture, free moisture, is in the snow, which has to do with temperature, but not completely. So obviously, the wetter the snow, the warmer the wax, and then if there's an ice layer or not. That's a key point. Oftentimes in clister races, especially around <clears throat> freezing or 30 to 35, you get that ice glaze, especially in multi-loop races. And in that case, you need to throw a little bit of silver in there. We don't make silver, but you need to throw a little silver in there. Um, I've got three questions left. What are the pros and cons of using a roto wool versus an iron? or other tools for application of the new waxes. Again, what are the best practices and what circumstances? Print, sprint versus marathon, individual versus waxing for a team, time and quantity considerations, snow type, soft powder versus abrasive ice or man-made. It's a great question. The waxing world is complicated. You've got roto wool application of solids. You've got liquid paraffins. You've got hot waxes. You've got paste waxes. And you've got powders. And next year, it's going to look even different. There are going to be other new products that I know we're coming out with. It's not practical, nor is it recommended, to me anyway, to test all these different types of modalities. Roto wool on a solid, pastes, liquid paraffins, hot waxes, and powders. 
to test all those much less different brands, much less different colors. Uh -uh. <clears throat> You're experimenting too much, testing too broadly. I think it's important to identify what you're comfortable with working with and to get really good at that, maybe limit that to two or three at the most forms of wax. Um, on the World Cup, uh, there are some people that specialize in some things and other people specialize in others. With Toco, yeah, we have roto, we have a roto wool and uh, it can be used with our hot waxes. But I think we have better results with our liquid paraffins, especially if you apply them properly. The end result is quite similar. You're putting a micro thin layer of wax on the surface of your ski. I'm thinking I'm just going to leave it in there. I can hear okay. something. Um, so that's that's the, the main thing I wanted to say about that. What would be top three waxes to have in a toolkit for the Midwest? Talking about kick and glide as well as, yeah, kick and glide. So for kick, I would say all of them. So base green, blue, red, and yellow for, for grip. That's only four waxes, a binder, and three colors. That's simple. <clears throat> for glide, it depends on your standard. If I was an elite racer, I would say X cold, high performance blue powder or hot wax, and high performance red. That that would get you through most of the races, just those three products. If I was a high school skier or not interested in spending a ton of money, I would go with base performance liquid paraffin blue, base performance liquid paraffin red, and base performance blue hot wax. Last question, and I've already covered this, so I'm going to call it. So I don't think I have the opportunity to ask for more questions. And I think we're over an hour. We're at an hour 20. Uh, it's been my pleasure to address you. Um, Toko is a proud sponsor of CXC and Team Berkey. And of course, as I said before, we, we support the ski community as best as we can. Um, if you have any questions for me, you can always email me at ian.harvey at brav.com. Or you can reply to any Toco eblast, and that'll come to me, and I'll answer your question. That's something I take pride in, and I enjoy very much is answering questions from people and helping people. <clears throat>